Good evening, everyone. My name is Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind presentation on bipolar disorder. We are very fortunate to have with us this evening the author of Too Bright to Hear, Too Loud to See, Miss Julianne Gary. Um, we are thrilled that you made the trip, Julianne, all the way from New York to be here this evening to speak with us about your book and about your personal experience. And we really appreciate you making the journey to be with us this evening. Thank you so much. Also with us this evening, and I have to say this is, we are very grateful to Dr. Michael Gitlin because this is his fourth time participating in a Friends program. The first one was when we were a very small organization and was in a salon in someone's home. And then we put him with, Julie, with Judy Collins, who belted out Amazing Grace and Michael Gitlin had to follow that act. <laughs> but he did a great job. And then we put him with Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> and now, Julianne, he's partnering with you. And we're really very grateful to Dr. Gitlin. Uh, for those of you who don't know Dr. Gitlin, he is a professor of clinical psychiatry. He is also the director of the Mood Disorders Clinic and the Director of Adult Psychiatry at the Semmel Institute. And we're very grateful to him for his participation in this program. And I do have to add that a lot of people think that I'm the founder of the Friends. But really, truly, it's Dr. Gitlin's idea that has brought this organization together. He was the one who said to me, we need a support group from the community and Cedars get, has all the support from the community, and UCLA has the best doctors, and we don't have anything. This he told me at our daughter's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll soon have the opportunity to meet our daughter. But I do want to thank Dr. Gitlin for everything he's done. Um, Also this evening, uh, also with us this evening is Dr. Andrew Luchter, who is a professor of biobehavioral sciences and psychiatry, and he is also the faculty advisor for the Friends. He will be moderating the question and answer portion of this evening's program. Uh, he will also be introducing his colleague, Dr. Michael Gitlin. And, um, uh, one thing that I did want to ask everybody for the question and answer program, we are going to have uh, index cards that will be passed out. So if you want to ask a question of any of our speakers after, the pre after their presentations, please write your question on an um, index card and someone will come by to pick it up. Um, also following the presentation and the Q&A, Julianne will be outside signing her book, which you will have an opportunity to purchase. Um, now, for those of you, I know most of you have been here before, but just in case there are a few people that are here for the first time, I have to tell you a little bit about the Friends of the Semmel Institute. Um, we are the support group for the world-renowned Semmel Institute, and we are very fortunate to have with us this evening the director of the Semmel Institute, Dr. Peter Weibrow. <laughs> The Friends produce and support the Open Mind community lecture and film series that's open to the public at no charge. Uh, we also support research through our Friends Research Scholar Program that supports the work of brilliant young scientists doing state-of-the-art research to develop new treatments and cures for illnesses of the mind and brain. Um, I believe that Felipe Jane uh, one of our friend scholars is here with us this evening. He is working. Please stand. He is uh, using his background uh, of Eastern meditation skills and his training as a psychiatrist 
to work with Alzheimer's caregivers who are at high risk for depression. So we're very, very proud of Dr. Jane and um, very happy to support his work. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce a very important board member of the Friends of the Semmel Institute. She's actually our muse, and that is our daughter, Dr. Robin Goodman Mandelberg, who will be introducing Julianne Gary. Thank you so much. I've checked them for my iPad about 10 times. <laughs> is this, is it okay? It's okay, okay. When I enter a room such as where we are now, especially where we are now, I quickly count the number of bipolars present. I have, if you will, a Badar, a sense of who is a member of my tribe. I can smell the lithium. <laughs> Once that has been established, I sniff out the family members of those patients. From them, I sniff the heartache, the setbacks, and the love and acceptance. This is my family who went through dozens of highs and lows, heartache, setbacks, love and acceptance. My family smells like this single pink rose my mother brought to the double locked door the first time I was admitted, the first of many hospitalizations, not the first flower. My psychiatrist has braved my illness with me from day one when I crash landed in her office at age 18, a cast off from Yale University. She is like a rose. She helps me to be brave, like a fictional character, brave Irene. Then I say, they say, <laughs> they say I inspire the friends, but really it is the friends that inspires me. I have had the pleasure of meeting a member of my bipolar tribe, Julianne Gary. Her first novel, Too Bright, whoa, Too Bright to Hear, Too Loud to See, was written from the point of view of her own struggles with bipolar illness. Too Bright to Hear, Too Loud to See follows the life of a bipolar studio executive. The author chronicles him in the throes of his illness, including treatments of ECT. The reader goes along with the ride through his world travels to, from his world travels to his residence in a locked ward. I am honored to introduce tonight's speaker, an honored guest, Julianne Gary. Hi. Thank you all for coming this evening. I want to thank the Friends of the Semmel Institute for inviting me here to speak tonight. I'm tremendously honored to be speaking here at the Semmel Institute, where so much important work and groundbreaking research is being done on bipolar disorder. I'm particularly grateful to Vicki Goodman for asking me to speak to you about bipolar disorder because I am not a neuroscientist or a biogeneticist or a psychiatrist, but because I'm just a regular person, who's a person who's lived with bipolar disorder for, ne for nearly 30 years. Last August, after reading an op-ed I wrote in the New York Times about my experience dealing with stigma in the medical community, Vicki invited me to come here and speak, to tell my story, as it were. I hope to offer perhaps a slightly different perspective on bipolar disorder, one that you may not have heard in the past, something that might be less clinical, maybe a little uncensored, somewhat close to the bone. I hope to put an individual face on bipolar disorder because all too often, those of us who are labeled with the diagnosis lose our individuality, and with that, we lose our humanity. I don't come with any charts or graphs or a PowerPoint presentation. What I have is my own story, and the story of a book I wrote during the most difficult and challenging period of my life, one that I thought often I wouldn't live through. Ten years ago, give or take, 
I started writing fiction for fun. I had no idea that one short story would eventually turn into a novel and no idea that it would end up featuring a bipolar character. But even less likely was the idea that I would ever at any point be standing in front of a group of people talking about my own bipolar disorder. Having been through the medical experience of having my identity stripped away as a result of my diagnosis and the stigma attached to it, I was in no particular hurry to do it publicly. Because when you tell somebody you have bipolar disorder, they will probably never look at you in the same way again. Even the most compassionate, well-meaning people tend to be overwhelmed by the word. For some people, particularly some doctors I've seen, it wipes clean the rest of your resume, your education, your accomplishments, and reduces you to that one word. You do not have bipolar. You are bipolar. So was I hesitant about announcing with the publication of my novel a year and a half ago that I have bipolar disorder? Absolutely. But I hid so much of my life during that time that I was too sick to do otherwise that to talk about it now feels a bit like a badge of survival. And along the way, I learned things about the healthcare system through my own experience that I believe need to be changed about stigma and about the lack of research and treatment options for people with bipolar disorder, particularly women. And I can't do much about those things if I keep my mouth shut. The other thing that encouraged me to speak up were the letters and emails I received from people who read the book. Time and again, they tell me what an isolating experience having bipolar disorder is. And they tell me that even though it's fiction, reading too bright to hear, too loud to see, somehow made them feel understood and less alone. And the astonishing thing for me is that it made me feel less alone too. So I'm talking about having bipolar disorder, about my particular experience with it as a woman and as a writer. As most of you know, bipolar disorder is a brain disorder that causes extreme shifts, not just in mood, but also in energy, activity levels, cognitive function, and the ability to carry out everyday tasks. During mania, some people may feel euphoric, grandiose, hypersexual, or like me, their manias can be predominantly dysphoric, which means we get obsessive, agitated, restless, and irritable. We can't stand the feeling of being in our own skin. An acute depressive episode is difficult to describe to someone who hasn't had one. The English language should really have a better word for it than depression. Something like all-encompassing black pit of life-sucking hopelessness would be slightly more accurate. <laughs> In a mixed episode, you get to experience both mania and depression at the same time. The feeling is akin to being buried alive. But in addition to those mood states, it is also possible for someone with bipolar disorder to experience a long-lasting period of unstable moods rather than discrete episodes of mania or depression. My life was forever changed, not just by having bipolar disorder, but by a period of instability that lasted just over seven years, starting when I was 39. After having managed my illness for eight years since I was diagnosed, which was 10 years after I was originally misdiagnosed with unipolar depression and put on antidepressants, my bipolar medications, it seemed, stopped working. My doctor couldn't figure out why. Over the course of those seven years, my life was completely derailed. I functioned some of the time, opted out of most social events, and bluffed my way through my professional interactions when absolutely necessary. Out of necessity, I became self-taught in the field of bipolar disorder, its causes, treatment options, which doctors were doing the most cutting-edge research, which alternative and experimental treatments showed the most promise. I also discovered enormous gaps in research where gender difference and bipolar disorder were concerned, something that 10 years later still exists. The profound effects hormonal changes can have on mood disorders, particularly bipolar, is just recently beginning to be acknowledged and explored. But 10 years ago, most of the doctors I consulted refused to entertain the idea that the connection even existed. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I didn't just wake up one day with treatment-resistant, ultra-rapid cycling bipolar 1. And I didn't, like many people with bipolar disorder, have a dramatic manic break in my early 20s that resulted in hospitalization, a quick diagnosis, and treatment with lithium. Actually, I kind of wish things had gone down that way. But in my case, my issue started much earlier, and not as bipolar disorder. 
I was always an extremely anxious kid. I had separation anxiety, severe school phobia, panic attacks, and a tendency in general to feel that if I didn't do everything perfectly and please everyone around me, the world would quite literally come to an end. My parents, who divorced when I was six, were not oblivious to these quirks of my personality. It was difficult to ignore the panic and vomiting that happened most mornings before fifth grade. So by the time high school came around, I'd seen a number of psychiatrists, none of whom I'm afraid had been terribly helpful. And yet somehow, in developing a group of close friends, some of whom are here tonight, I grew out of a lot of my fears and phobias. And by the end of sophomore year, I even had a steady boyfriend. The summer after my junior year in high school, I finally felt confident enough to leave home for the first time. I had never been to sleepaway camp. So I went for a month to theater camp in New Hampshire. Two weeks in, I got a call saying my father had killed himself. He was 46. I knew my dad had been depressed. I'd spoken to him four days earlier on his birthday, and he had cried on the phone. I was 16 and had no idea what to do in the face of his depression. So I told him I loved him and got off the phone as quickly as I could. I don't blame my 16-year-old self, but more than 30 years later, I still wish I had stayed on the phone longer, had asked him if he was talking to someone and if anyone was listening. Much later, I found out that my father, who had always had a tendency toward depression, had been put on an antidepressant. In the last months of his life, his behavior had become extremely erratic, paranoid. More than likely, he'd been having a mixed episode. In addition to being, in my opinion, the most intolerable mood state, it is most certainly the most dangerous kind of episode. It's when people are most likely to commit suicide. Had my father been given lithium instead of an antidepressant, he might still be alive today. Many experts in the field now believe the worst thing that you, you can do is give someone with bipolar disorder an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer. There is considerable risk that it will cause mania, medication-induced mania. It happened to my father, and years later, when we took Prozac, it happened to me and to other members of my family. I had my first depressive, major depressive episode my freshman year of college. I was at Barnard where I, only, where I only went because my high school boyfriend was already a student at NYU. I didn't even realize how depressed I was that year. I had developed a serious eating disorder by then and had multiple dissociative episodes during which I would find myself in places in the city having no idea how I got there and what I had done in the many hours that had passed. I was incapable of maintaining the relationship I was in, hated Barnard, and did nothing but study so I could transfer. My father's suicide had left me numb my senior year of high school, but its effects hit me full force that first year of college. I was still depressed and anorexic when I got to New Haven, so I went to another psychiatrist there. As soon as she, or any other psychiatrist for that matter, heard my family history, I have a lot of what psychiatrists refer to as genetic loading, she diagnosed depression and prescribed an antidepressant. At the time, my best options were tricyclics, but I've never been able to tolerate side effects, so I didn't take them for long. It was the arrival a few years later of Prozac on the scene that changed everything for me. 36 hours after taking my first 20 milligram dose, I was high as a kite. I'd never felt better. This should have been an enormous red flag to the therapist and psychiatrist who prescribed the Prozac. They were well-meaning people, but they didn't recognize the signs of hypomania, of medication-induced switching. Eventually, chasing the same initial high I felt, which always ended in another depressive episode, I worked my way up to 120 milligrams of Prozac, cycling in and out of hypomania and depression with occasional periods of quasi-normalcy, or euthymia. This went on for almost a decade. Unless your initial episode is manic, historically, this kind of misdiagnosis is common for people with bipolar disorder. I was finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder after my second child was born. I was 31. After a very post bad postpartum depression, I went back on Prozac, and it just didn't work anymore. The general psychiatrist I'd been seeing finally sent me to a psychopharmacologist. It took quite a while 
quite a while to find a combination of mood stabilizers that worked for me. Medication for my doctors and me has always been and continues to be more of an ongoing chemistry experiment. But for almost eight years, until I was not quite 40, that psychopharmacologist managed to keep me fairly stable. I didn't particularly like her. She was humorless and kind of scary. She wasn't interested in my input at all. And she had a bizarre fixation with birds. But she was very conscientious. <laughs> and besides, I didn't know any better. <laughs> Suddenly, though, just before I turned 40, those drugs not only seemed to stop working, but my symptoms mysteriously got much, much worse. In addition to depression and dysphoric mania, I was having panic attacks, bouts of rage, night sweats, insomnia, and ultra, ultra rapid cycling, sometimes multiple extreme mood switches over the course of a single day. It was like being on a perpetual bad acid trip. This was 2005. It was the beginning of an odyssey. The doctors, Western, integrative, alternative, psychiatric, endocrine, gynecological, pharmacological, neurological, tests, saliva, blood, urine, MRIs, CAT scans, and drug trials and their side effects, which are far, far too many to go into. We'd be here all night. For years, I hung suspended in the crack that exists between psychiatry and women's medicine. It wasn't all that long before it occurred to me that there might very well be a hormonal component to this mystery. It actually seemed pretty obvious given my symptoms. But getting my psychopharmacologist to believe me wasn't very easy. In fact, she was pretty dismissive. I sought a second opinion from an integrative psychiatrist who sent me to an alternative gynecologist who conducted a battery of bizarre tests and prescribed 50, literally 50 supplements a day and a disgusting tasting estrogen milkshake. Then six weeks into this regimen, I got a letter saying he was moving his practice to Baltimore with a train schedule. <laughs> I took that as a sign. I continued to do research and had more consultations than I can count. I was eventually forced to quit my full-time job as an editor at a women's magazine. I was just too sick too much of the time to work. But I freelanced from home when I could, and the other thing that happened during this seven-year period was that I wrote most of my first novel. I believe it was the intensity of what I was experiencing that gave me access to the raw, uncensored emotions expressed by the main character, some of which are not so easy on the reader. <coughs> too Bright to Hear, Too Loud to See is about a studio executive named Grayson Todd who abandons his life, his wife, and his eight-year-old daughter and his high-powered job and travels the world, giving free reign to the bipolar disorder he's been forced to hide for 20 years. The narrative interweaves three timelines. His present day travels through Italy, Thailand, Bangkok, Chile, Israel, Uganda. His childhood growing up with a father who suffered from the same, at the time, undiagnosed illness, and the intimacies and estrangements of his marriage. The book spans 40 years, but unfolds in the time it takes him to undergo 12 30-second electroshock therapy treatments in a New York psychiatric hospital. I wrote many of the most intense passages of the book as I was experiencing them. Frequently, I was writing what I felt in the moment, which means if I was depressed, Grayson was depressed. So an example of how that worked is a scene that I'm going to read, set in Palo Alto in 1965, just after Grayson comes home from his first hospital stay after a psychotic break. He has not been diagnosed and is unmedicated, and his mania has turned to depression. I always wondered how I would know when I had hit bottom. Somehow the perpetual terror of dangling after the bottom had fallen out always seemed more obvious, a step beyond and more self-evident than hitting it in the first place, especially the first time. Because the first time, you always think it could be worse. You always think maybe you're just tired, or coming down with something, or under a lot of stress, or overthinking things, or second-guessing yourself doubting the choices you've made. You always think you just need a break from work and friends and the phone and your family, that you just need a rest. You think you should have the answer to the question, what's wrong? You wish you knew. No one can understand how much you wish you knew. You know you must be horrible to live with, to be around, 
because you cannot stand to be you, to be in your own skin. You think you should be able to promise it will stop a month from last Friday. You can't imagine it will ever stop. You would do anything to make it stop. Instead, you say maybe you just need a day to lie in bed, and then you take another and another and another and 20 more, and you think you'd rather not get up at all, ever, over. You want it over. You would do anything. And before your wife goes grocery shopping, she asks if it's OK to leave you alone. And you look at her like you don't know what you, she means, but you do. And you laugh and say, of course, don't be ridiculous. But that was yesterday. Now you're standing in front of the medicine cabinet, and you're insulted that she didn't believe you because she's emptied it of everything but Q-tips and Tampax and cotton balls. You thought you meant it, but that was yesterday. And yesterday is a whole world away from this pain. Today you're tearing through the kitchen drawers with more energy than you've had in weeks. You wonder where the hell she could have hidden everything because spoons and butter knives and rubber spatulas are the only utensils left. And you catch yourself running your thumb over the impotent edge of a butter knife, wondering how much damage you could coax out of it. You imagine yourself like an animal caught in a trap, gnawing away at your wrist with that little butter knife. How undignified. How pathetic. And then you think, no, I am not my father. You are not your father. He couldn't even do this right. And you hated him for failing. You are not him. And you throw the butter knife back in the defanged drawer and slam it shut. You were just browsing, just browsing. And that is not the same thing at all. So you cross that option off the list for now. Because when the time comes, yours will not be some half-assed attempt, some pathetic bid for attention. You will mean it. But you are not quite there yet. Not yet. So you go back to the same old routine. Panic and despair, panic and despair in endless succession, or worse, at the same time, until it does become routine. Your routine, her routine. And as soon as she leaves for work, or even sometimes when she's home and you're in the shower, on the rare occasions when you have the energy to take one, you hear heaving, open-mouthed howls of breath-stealing grief, and realize when you gasp and choke on the saliva and snot running down the back of your throat that you are the source of the screaming. And then you stop. You close your mouth and swallow it all and pull yourself together because you know that you're just tired or coming down with something. You know there are people out there with real problems. You know it could be worse. You have a wife who loves you and a good job. You know you're lucky. So you stand up and you strap on your balls and you go out there. You smile and you pretend you can feel the bottom under your feet. I did not set out to write too bright to hear too loud to see as a vehicle for showing how bipolar disorder feels, how much it hurts, not consciously anyway. It was meant to be a fictional story about one man's particular experience. I've been asked in several interviews whether the book is autobiographical. The answer is both yes and no. The plot and characters are largely fictitious, though like most writers, I stole elements, details, and scenes from my own life. I wanted, for example, to evoke a very specific sense of place and time, the 1970s in Los Angeles, which is when I grew up and the time I remember my father best. But what the protagonist, Grayson Todd, experiences as he tumbles in and out of mania and depression that is 100% me, splattered all over the page. I'm also frequently asked why I chose to write in a man's voice. And, why the, and while the book began as a short story, very loosely based on what I imagined my father's childhood to have been like, and which quickly became fictionalized, Grayson is nothing like my dad, who was in many ways the anti-Grayson, ethical, deeply loyal, kind, and responsible to a fault. If you know the famous poem, Richard Corey, well, in a lot of ways, my dad was that guy. So how did I come up with what some editors and publishers ref refer to as a very unsympathetic character? First of all, I never felt he was unsympathetic. Certainly, he does things that make it difficult to love, to love him. But I always felt that Grayson is acting out of the tremendous pain caused by his illness. And I've always felt very protective of him. And what I came to realize fairly recently, actually, is that Grayson is an expression of the tremendous anger I experienced during that period of time 
but which I never allowed myself or that I was never allowed to express or even feel in my own life. I was so angry about being so sick for so long, about losing my professional identity, my financial independence, my self-esteem, my sense of place in the world. And yet still the good girl, I didn't feel like there was anyone to blame except frequently myself for not trying harder, not doing better. The doctors were trying, they were doing the best they could, so I couldn't get mad at them. I had two young children at home, so I had to suppress, swallow, and domesticate my rage so that no matter how terrible I felt, they suffered as little as possible. And so I poured it all into Grayson, who for seven years became my constant companion, my best friend and conduit. The act of writing the fictional character of Grayson was in a certain way a satisfyingly performative act that memoir could never have been for me. This was also a very isolating time. Chronic illness is, by its very nature, inherently isolating. Bipolar disorder is not, as a friend of mine likes to say, a casserole disease. In my experience, it's rare that anyone comes over with food for your family when you're too depressed to get out of bed to shower, much less cook. A couple of years into this mess, I decided I had to find a psychiatrist who knew about both bipolar disorder and women. I was fed up with trying to get doctors in the two separate fields to talk to each other. My extensive Googling turned up only one doctor on the East Coast who had done any work on gender differences in bipolar disorder. He was affiliated with Columbia and had an office on the Upper West Side not far from where I lived. And his name was Prince. Finally, my prince had come. I emailed him sounding every bit as desperate as I was. Dr. Prince explained exactly how my bipolar brain was misfiring in reaction to what are, for most women, normal hormonal fluctuations. There was no point in testing my blood or anything else. The problem was my brain. How to fix it was another story. And so we began to research it together and found that there was virtually nothing out there. No studies, no established protocols. We had to make it up as we went along. And the treatment was often as bad or worse than where I'd started. Trials of various birth control pills that failed, an experimental drug for prostate cancer that made me psychotic, repeated suggestions by, women, by doctors in women's medicine with whom we consulted that I have a complete hysterectomy. And then at some point, Dr. Prince announced he was moving to San Diego in a few months, which didn't help matters. Finally, we tried Lupron, a powerful fertility drug that shut off all my hormones essentially inducing menopause in the space of a week. It worked. The cycling stopped. The depression lifted. But the side effects were debilitating. Among other things, the sudden drop in estrogen caused a migraine headache that went on for weeks. Percocet and Vicodin did nothing. Dr. Prince insisted I go to the emergency room for something stronger. As a person with bipolar disorder, I had experienced the stigma, or let's call it what it is, discrimination, some doctors and other healthcare workers perpetrate against the mentally ill. But just try walking into a New York City emergency room, listing the drugs you take for your bipolar disorder on your intake form, and then asking for painkillers for your migraine. In my particular case, the resident in charge spoke to me as if I were in her preschool class. My husband signed papers, and then her intern consulted and hooked me up to an IV. This will make you feel much better, he told me. I asked him what drug it was, and he mumbled something that didn't sound familiar. So I asked him to spell it so my husband could write it down. Two hours later, the headache was no better, so he gave up and went home. When I told Dr. Prince, he said, they gave you saline and electrolytes, basically a placebo. Welcome to being bipolar. After finally seeing a headache specialist, it became clear the only way to lose the headache was to lose the Lupron. I'd spent the past six weeks in bed with an excruciating migraine, but I'd been stable for the first time in years. The physical pain was nothing compared to the endless cycling, but apparently it's not medically advisable to let a migraine go on indefinitely. I asked Dr. Prince how long it would take before I lost my mind again. It took about two weeks, and I lost it with a vengeance. The severe mixed episode came on suddenly and with the impact of a Mack truck. It was the closest I have ever come to suicide. The following ex excerpt was written on February 9th, 2009. Today, my new incoming psychopharmacologist is a uh, the outgoing 
one, Dr. Prince is abandoning me for warmer, sunnier, more cheerful climes. Let slip, he thinks I'm harboring the suicide gene. Yes, apparently there is one. On what does he base this somewhat alarming piece of information, which I, of course, choose to take, and frankly, who wouldn't, as a death sentence? Admittedly, his evidence is purely anecdotal. But let's start with the fact that he's a big gun in the bipolar world. Also, he finds my family and me scientifically interesting, at least enough to take me on as a patient. Then there's the interesting bit of trivia borne out by the people who study these things, or more accurately, the people who are studied, that violent suicides run in families, and that people with violent suicidal ideation, i.e. gun, window, roof, razor, versus some less destructive mode of self-destruction, like, for example, sleeping pills, are much more likely to have the gene. Finally, there's the fact that my father shot himself and that three of his uncles committed suicide, at least one with a gun. The other two are still up for grabs. So that's four suicides in the space of two generations. And actually, there's been one more since, so that's five. For obvious reasons, I have always been very anti-firearm. But I have an unfelt, unhealthy fascination with sharp, shiny objects. And most recently, on one bleak winter afternoon, I found myself standing on the top of our couch in front of an open window, sobbing. Why didn't I jump? That's easy. I don't want to die. But in my most desperate moments, I believe I would do, will do, anything to stop the suffocating, all-consuming, excruciating misery and panic. And those, in those moments, hours, days, weeks, I cannot fathom the possibility that it might stop on its own. In those moments, it is keeping myself from jumping that is hard. A week ago, I was one frosty breath away from the same irrevocable action my father took, the one I'm sure he would have lived to regret if he had lived. I wish I didn't know about the suicide gene. There are lots of things I wish I didn't know. Like, for example, that rapid cycling bipolar disorder, the kind I have, is harder to treat and has a poorer prognosis than other kinds. Or that, in all likelihood, my hippocampus is shrinking. I wish I could say that's really just a euphemism intended to mean that my ass is getting smaller. <laughs> no such luck. It means I'm getting dull, cognitively speaking. Socially, I'm still the sparkling wonder I always was, a marginally reclusive sociophobe who works from home. But the brain thing is troubling. It was one of my best features. Now, on most days, holding a thought in my head is like trying to hold water in one hand. The hippocampus is in charge of things like the consolidation of new memories, emotions, navigation, and spatial orientation. Fabulous. Crazy was a given, but clumsy, stupid, and lost? Dr. Prince says, when I'm stable, a phrase I'm beginning to equate with, when the Messiah comes, all these faculties will come back to me. Incoming guy says, not so much. These changes are real and permanent. But he adds, subtle, so not to worry. Not to worry, as in light bulbs out in the bathroom not to worry, or more like maybe I should start wearing a medic alert ID bracelet so that if I get lost and can no longer remember my own address or name, some nice person will be able to wipe the drool off my face and take me home not to worry, because there's kind of a big difference. I take a lot of drugs. These days, none of them seems to do much, but lithium has anti-suicidal properties. Both Dr. Outgoing and Dr. Incoming have told me this. You need to stay on it, they say. Don't worry about the dose, they also both say. One always worries about the dose with lithium. There's a fine line between the therapeutic dose and the toxic one. But I'm good about taking my lithium. I don't want to die. Those 10 minutes on the windowsill were enough to prove to me, to mark me profoundly and indelibly, to make me realize that suicide is not about having a plan. <coughs> It is not about wanting to get out and away. It is about impulse control, having it and losing it. So I take my lithium every fucking day. The very last thing Dr. Prince said to me before he left town was, we will find an answer. There is always an answer. Sometimes you just have to get creative. I was hospitalized for severe depression three weeks later. I did surprisingly well in the hospital. I slept, I read, I did yoga. In 12 days, I had only one bad episode. Many of the details in the hospital section of the book are taken from what I observed during my stay at Columbia Presbyterian, though I will admit 
The romance is something I cooked up myself. But Glenda, Grayson's psych ward girlfriend, is loosely based on a patient with whom I was very vaguely acquainted while I was there. Glenda is one of my favorite characters, so I have to read just a, a little bit about her. It is difficult, I'm finding, to make friends on the psych ward. Certainly we all have something in common, but usually I find it's just the one thing, and mutual insanity is not a good foundation for a friendship. <laughs> or maybe I'm overly demanding, but I'm more delighted than a grown man should be when I discover that the beautiful and maniacal Glenda loves movies almost as much as I do, that she can quote dialogue from the Maltese Falcon, North by Northwest, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Last Tango in Paris, the difference between us is that for the time being anyway, I have a grasp on where the movie ends and reality begins, but no one is perfect. Glenda may be certifiable, but she knows her cinema and she has earned my respect. And so we have become friends, and then some. The then some really started because of basic instinct. Glenda is not the only patient with issues that might induce the staff to monitor our viewing a little more closely. But despite the various pathologies wandering the ward, they let us watch virtually anything on TV. Sex, violence, the abuse of small animals, particularly on the weekends when group activities are pared down to a minimum and the depressive doldrums kick in. And so one bleak Saturday afternoon, eight or ten of us, patients and staff members alike, found ourselves watching Basic Instinct, a film which Glenda has seen 13 times. I fucked Michael Douglas, she blurted out at one point but he disrespected me, so I broke it off. Five minutes went by. He begged me to take him back, practically stalked me. Shut up, Glenda, you're full of shit and we're trying to watch, said Esther, an orthodox ECT patient who, on top of everything else, had to suffer the indignity of wearing a bad wig. I wondered, though, if for Esther, watching movies like Basic Instinct was the next best thing to eating lobster. <laughs> I don't appreciate the coarse language, Esther, Glenda said twisting her long, dark, wild hair into a bun. And I'm not full of shit. I had to get a restraining order against Mr. Michael Douglas. Shh! Eight people simultaneously shut Glenda down. I smiled at her. Are you laughing at me? Not at all, I said. I believe you, 100%. I've worked with Douglas. I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> she dragged her folding chair so that she sat directly across from me. You have? It was years ago. By the time Catherine Tremell was getting interrogated by Detective Nick Curran, Glenda had slipped off her underwear. Using a crayon as a cigarette and reciting Sharon Stone's dialogue word for word, inflection for inflection, she let her hospital gown ride up and her paper white thighs fall apart until, until I was staring directly into her pussy. She left her mark on the vinyl covered chair. After that, the ball was in my court. But it is not easy to have an affair on a psych ward. It may be even harder than killing yourself. I had been sent to Columbia for electroshock therapy, something Dr. Prince was very much against at the time, but the new doctor, the big gun in the field, insisted was the only thing that would save my life. The whole hormone theory, the new doctor said, was baseless, ridiculous. I was rejected for ECT because I was too well in the hospital, and my history of rapid cycling apparently made me an unfit candidate. But I'd been taken off all my other medication in preparation for the ECT. So three days before my release, the doctor in charge of my case put me on one standard mood stabilizer and sent me home. I was also sent for DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, in which you are taught to regulate your emotions, and which can be very helpful for some people. But very shortly after my release, it became clear that neither of these standard treatments was working. Not creative, I kept thinking. The cycling began, began again just like before, violent extreme mood shifts. The social worker at DBT class told me I had to try harder. I had to be patient. That I might have to learn to live with feeling this way. Not an option, I thought. There has to be an answer. There is always an answer. My new, new doctor was Dr. Prince's protege, a young woman who was not a specialist in bipolar disorder, but he promised was very smart and would consult with him. She didn't know what to think. 
but she was interested in women's psychiatric medicine and she was willing to listen. I wanted to try the Lupron again, this time with the help of an endocrinologist who would do hormone replacement therapy, and that's what we did. It took over a year and an extraordinary reproductive endocrinologist working very closely with my psychopharmacologist as a team on my case, not something a lot of doctors I've found are willing to do. We had to find exactly the right level of estrogen, not too much, not too little. That took over a year, four to five blood tests a week, and a seemingly endless combination of pills, patches, and gels until we could get it right and get it to stabilize. Too much estrogen causes severe manic episodes that resulted in this passage, last one I'm going to read, which is, um, became Grayson's final break before he's hospitalized. There are numbers on the streets and names on the avenues. I should know where I am. This should feel more or less like a place feels when it's where you live. But the coordinates are off. The city is not where I left it this morning. I look over and see the entrance to the 125th Street station and the stairs leading to the raised platform. I'm guessing that is where I came from. This shouldn't be so hard for me. I know that. But these last few days, no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to come up with a better version of myself. The noise in my head is like a radio, constant. It skips quickly from station to station and then back again, trying to find a frequency. Meantime, it's all in, all the time, all at once. Whatever's out there is in here, skidding, shouting, banging, laughing. Don't be that way, baby. Don't fuck with me, asshole. Don't know why I bother. Don't walk, don't walk, don't walk, walk, walk on by. Bye bye, bye 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 baby, wet, wet, what, drip, wet, fuck, wet, drip, drip. How many drops are dripping from this goddamn scaffolding? One, two, three, four, drops or seconds. I've lost count, start again. No, stop, stop, stupid, boring, crazy, lazy. Get outside your fucking head, look outside, look. Liquor store, laundromat, chicken shack, Dunkin' Donuts, Hairweave Palace. Wish they'd stay still. They switch places when I blink, just to fuck with me. Donuts, blink, chicken, chicken, blink, laundry. Laundromat, hair palace, liquor store, liquor mat, laundry palace, shell game, musical fucking chairs, just to fuck with me. I walk away, walk this way, walk away, Renee, and my feet take over. The sound, the rhythmic clip plop on the blacktop, the boom clop, clip bop, stop, can't stop, clop, boom, skip, stop, chick a boom bop, Miles fucking Davis, John fucking Coltrane, jazz man, I'm the man, I'm the anchor man, news and weather on the eights, all the eights, that's a lot of eights. It is tedious, monotonous, onerous, listening to my own news and weather all day, all night long on the eights. And underneath the sound of my own voice in my own head is the rhythm of my own feet on the ground, the containable soft shoe that escalates into the full-blown percussive rat jazz rat scat that will not be tamed, the unlikely soundtrack to my interminable AM radio anchorman monologue. I am fascinated by my ability to syncopate, enumerate, ruminate, calculate, self-flagellate, it occupies every millimeter of available space in my head. I want to take a broom and sweep it out my ears like dust out an attic window, but there will be more. On the eights, every eight, all day, all night, no matter how much or how often I sweep it away, the noise will always come back. I know enough, am aware enough, to know that what I am hearing or thinking, which is it? Don't know. Does it matter? Doesn't matter. Is crazy shit. Or rather, it, it is the shit that fills the heads of crazy people. But I should get points for self-awareness, because if I know it, then I'm not. If I were really crazy, I would think I was God, or Jesus, or Mick Jagger. That's what crazy people think. But I don't. I know who I am, which is a relief, because I was getting worried. Not really, but a little, because of the noise. I've spent too much time alone lately, too much time in my own head, thus the noise problem. I'm out of practice with words, need to use them out loud again. I decided it would be a good idea to have a conversation with someone. Nothing too hard or too big, no politics or religion, not even the weather, just a verbal exchange, a verbal transaction, maybe an actual transaction. I look up, chicken, donuts, laundry, liquor, hair weave, not a tough choice, as long as they stay still. As I walk past the bums huddled under their filthy blankets, shopping carts tethered to their ankles, the dirty bastards tell me to stop kidding myself that there's a puddle of piss there waiting with my name on it. Lie down, make yourself comfortable. 
I spit on the ground in front of one of them and get it in his face. Someday the skies will open and a flood will come and wash all the scum like you off the streets. Huh? He looks at me confused, scared. Like I'm the crazy one. Like I'm the one with the problem. Don't fuck with me, asshole, I scream at him. He looks up. Okay, man, whatever you say. Then I head across the street toward the friendly pink neon sign, happily buzzing the word liquor. It's right where I left it. I feel better already. Once the hormone puzzle was solved, we could finally begin to treat the bipolar disorder itself. I had tried just about every drug imaginable, but a little known antiviral drug called amantadine finally worked for my bipolar depression. Since then, my doctors and I have continued to make adjustments as new or better drugs become available. The goal is always to reduce the side effects and the little blips and dips that still occur. This will be a lifelong pursuit, because as much as we'd like to think psychopharmacology is simply science, it's really quite an art. I am now on an unusually creative regimen, one that was achieved for the incredible persistence and groundbreaking hard work of doctors who were willing to truly listen, who fought the insurance companies on my behalf, and most of all, who believed that as the patient, I had something fundamental to contribute to the conversation about my own care. It's the kind of care everyone with a mental illness deserves, and far too, too few receive. I had been hoping to start this talk with a joke, something to break the ice and make us all feel a little more relaxed. The unfortunate thing is that while I think you'll find many people with bipolar disorder share a kind of gallows humor without which we would not survive, there isn't actually anything very funny about the illness itself. After the book came out, I did a radio interview with a celebrity psychiatrist who has a number of radio and TV shows and who shall re remain nameless. The other guest on the show was a man named Andy Berman, who is known in the mental health world for having had the rare experience of spending virtually his entire illness in a manic state. The average person with bipolar one spends, I believe, three times as much time depressed as manic. For people who have bipolar two, time depressed is even higher. In any case, this radio doctor kept asking Andy to talk about all the hilarious and outrageous things he'd done while he was manic among them a stint as a male prostitute in Times Square and getting himself sent to prison. And as Andy recounted these events, which are detailed in his memoir, the doctor just laughed and said, I love bipolars. You have such great stories. It's just so hilarious. Or it would be if it didn't ruin your lives. <laughs> then the celebrity doctor asked me what crazy things I did when I was manic. Well, I pretty much tanked that interview. The doctor radio host wasn't interested in hearing about depression or dysphoric mania. He was interested in bipolar disorder as entertainment. But despite the fact that it's been fe featured in a lot of television shows and a few films lately, some more realistically than others, for most people bipolar disorder isn't sexy or entertaining. It's painful and sometimes devastating. There are a number of reviews that have called too bright to hear too loud to see a page turner and for God knows what reason, Amazon categorizes it as a psychological thriller. <laughs> I'm told it has a certain dark humor throughout, so hopefully it is in some respects entertaining as a work of fiction. But mostly, I think, if you read it, what you'll get is a feeling of what it's like to live in the skin of someone who is in the middle of the tornado of bipolar disorder. Or if you have it yourself, hopefully, a feeling of recognition and a sense that you aren't alone. Though I didn't do the things that Grayson does in the book, I felt all the things he feels, and I want you to know that it is possible to survive and live with bipolar disorder, even a long-lasting period of instability, and come out the other end stronger, wiser, and with something to show for it. You just have to keep telling yourself there is always an answer. Sometimes you just have to get really creative. Thank you for listening.
you know, it's, it's hard to follow that kind of performance. Um, I cannot thank you enough, Julianne, for an enormously powerful and, and very moving talk and for sharing your experiences. Thank you very, very much. I know there are going to be many of you who will have questions this evening. Uh, we will have some uh, volunteers coming in the aisles with question cards, so please uh, grab one and write down your question, pass them to the aisle, and we'll try to get to them in the question and answer period at the end. Uh, Vicki asked me to get up here this evening and uh, introduce to you Dr. Michael Gitlin. Um, she did the easy part. She gave all of his t professional titles. And you know, I've known Michael for years, and I'm sort of, you can know somebody very well and really f struggle to find a way to introduce them at a time like this. And then I heard Julianne describe her psychopharmacologist as humorless, scary, and unusually fixated on birds. And I thought, <laughs> well, that'll do it. Uh, I actually couldn't think of anything further from the truth. Um, probably the, the best way, <coughs> excuse me, to introduce Michael um, is that he is just one of those go-to psychiatrists, uh, not just on the UCLA faculty, but really in the Los Angeles community. Um, somebody who is a uh, cherished colleague and friend who we can always count on when we need an expert opinion, and not just an expert scientific opinion or a psychopharmacologic opinion, but also um, I think one of the things that Julianne spoke about in her talk, the importance of having a colleague who has an enormously compassionate perspective on patient care. Um, so it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to my friend and colleague, Michael. That was good. Thank you. Um, I suspect, I think, that following Miss Gary is maybe not quite as bad as following Judy Collins speaking Amazing Grace, but very close. Uh, so, I'm very pleased to be here. As Vicki said, this is indeed my fourth time doing this, and it is striking that my first time really was in a living room in Los Feliz. And I'm thrilled to see how the Friends has evolved and expanded to the organization it was meant to be and that we all hoped it was, would be, and in fact it is. I'm going to talk, not surprisingly, about bipolar disorder. But before that, I want to say a few words about Miss Gary's book. I don't know how many of you have read it. I read it when I knew I'd be doing this. I thought, well, I should certainly read the novel. And so I got a copy of it. And I thought, all right, you know, I'll take a week or so to read it, and two to three days I was done. It was a page turner in the best sense. It's a mesmerizing book, and yes, it, it, the description, the subjective description of bipolar disorder is extraordinary, but beyond that, it's really a terrific novel. It has a great LA feel. I mean, it was clear to me before I knew, knew it that she had lived some point in her life in LA. It was just too much, a too much local color and a great feel for the entertainment industry for those of us who are either in it, not me, or those, those of us who treat a lot of it, like me and other people I, th I suspect in the room. I'm also amazed when a woman can write a first person narrative as a man and get it right, showing us for the assholes we are. It was extraordinary. I thought, how did she know that that's what we think and feel? So it was remarkable. Also, of course, the book is really an amazingly clear description of the subjective states of bipolar disorder, depressions, euphoric manias, mixed states, etc. the interaction between substance abuse and manic depressive illness. And I was very glad to hear Ms. Gary talk about the, at least briefly, the relationship between her and Grayson, how their, her experience informs Grayson, her major protagonist, but it isn't the same. You know, I've spent 40 years reading Philip Roth and listening to the interviews in which he keeps swearing 
that he's not Alexander Portnoy of Portnoy's Complaint, and he's really not Mickey Sabbath of Sabbath's Theater. So I absolutely, I get that, that how it informs, but it's not the same. And I'm glad for you. <laughs> um, I think my first major message then about bipolar disorder for tonight is really that bipolar disorder is a disorder with extraordinary varied manifestations and expressions, both within individuals and across individuals. Not every episode is alike, and certainly different people with the disorder experience it differently, they have different courses, and they respond very differently to different kinds of treatments, and I'll talk about all of those. And that is, so I would say to you, do not take any individual experience for tonight, Miss Gary's experience, especially I don't want the men in the room saying, oh my God, I gotta go see a gynecologist and get my estrogens checked. <laughs> that is not a universal experience. It is the unique experience of some individuals and other people have other biologies and psychologies of mood disorders that are not the same. And this is not a new thought, certainly not for me, as uh, I think Vicky said, July 1st will be the 36th year that I'm directing the Mood Disorders Clinic. So I have seen a lot of mood disorders over almost three and a half decades, and they really are all different. And that too is not new. Emil Kreppelin, who was the first one in our field, German psychiatrist in the late 19th and early 20th century, was the first one to say, you know, maybe bipolar disorder is, is different than schizophrenia. Well, he didn't say that, first of all, because he spoke German, and secondly, <laughs> Because he said, maybe dementia precox, which was schizophrenia, early cognitive dementia, is different than manic depressive insanity, which is what bipolar disorder was called then. He realized very clearly that bipolar disorder and schizophrenia had a different course. Schizophrenia, his, his cartoon of it was you had an episode, you got better from the episode, but not as better as you were before the first one. And with each episode, you went kind of downhill, so the curve was like this. But even that is a cartoon. For an ex as an example, one of our former speakers at one of these forums was Professor Ellen Sachs from USC, who has schizophrenia and has not had anything like a downhill course. Most of the rest of us in this room have not won a MacArthur Genius Award, which she won after 30 years of having schizophrenia. His cartoon of bipolar disorder was discrete episodes, between times, people with manic depressive illness, synonymous term, had, were really doing fine and they recovered completely. Well, that's frequently true, but there is a toll to be taken, as Ms. Gary told very clearly, about the repeated episodes. And in thinking about the variability of the disorder, which is one of my messages, this is the translated English, thank God. Kreplin said in 1921, if we give no more examples, that is not because those already given represent adequately the multiplicity of the courses taken by manic depressive insanity. It is absolutely inexhaustible. Well, if you translate that into 21st century English, what he's saying is the expressions of this disorder are so varied that whatever you can show, I can show you something that looks different and is still bipolar. And I think 100, 140 years ago, uh, Kreplin got it right. So let me talk a little bit about the variability of bipolar disorder as we think about it now. For those of you who are aficionados of the DSM-5, get a life, but <laughs> still in all, for those of you who read about it, it, get, it divides bipolar disorder, as we've done for numbers of years, into bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder. Bipolar 1 are those people who've had just one full-blown manic episode in a life. Bipolar 2 disorder is those people who've never had a ma manic episode. They've had hypomanias, which are essentially mild manias. So how do you distinguish between a mild mania, called hypomania, and a full mania? It is amazing when I talk to psychiatrists who've been out in the world for a while, some of whom are even are graduates of our programs, they actually can't remember how you tell the difference between hypomania and mania. Is it the number of days? Uh, is it the number of symptoms? No, it's in fact whether you trash your life or not. The issue is, the level of functional impairment. There's much we can say critical of the DSM, but in this one they got it right. You should, you should make the distinction if it matters to the person and to the people they care about and to their lives. So what's an example of trashing your life called marked functional impairment in the DSM? It would be 
pissing away a life savings, getting fired from a job because you are bipolar, um, ruining a long-term relationship, unusual or not characteristic, for instance, uh, affairs with someone else that ruin the relationship, getting arrested, getting um, hospitalized. There is no such thing as admission diagnosis of hypomania. If you're bad enough to be in the hospital, that's mania, or being psychotic. If you hear voices or have delusions, that's mania. You can't be psychotically hypomanic. Hypomania is by definition milder. And I think that's right. When it's severe, that alerts the treaters to say, this is one we got to really deal with much more carefully because the upside has much more destructive potential. Clearly, as Ms. Gary expressed beautifully, the distinction, there are other distinctions like euphoric manias, Robin Williams on speed, versus a mixed state, which you described so perfectly as where the engine is running too fast and the mood is dreadful. And you're right, that is a very difficult time because one of the reasons more depressed people don't commit suicide is they don't have the energy or the cognitive wherewithal to plan it out. But if you have the impulsive, explosive energy of mania and the dysphoric or depressive mood simultaneously, that's a very tricky, dangerous situation, especially if it gets added to with some substance abuse, which unfortunately happens with some regularity. Some bipolar patients get psychotic, formal hallucinations and delusions. When they're in episodes, some don't. Dep uh, psychosis is more common in depression than it is in mania. And bipolar depression is more characterized by psychotic features than regular non-bipolar depression, unipolar depression, as we call it. As Ms. Gary absolutely said from your obvious reading, it, the, the hip way of saying it is mania is the, the defining feature of bipolar disorder, but depression is the dominant pole. If you say that at a party, it'll really make you popular. It's a very <laughs> kind of hip thing to say. And in fact, it's absolutely true. The DSM and all of our diagnostic sy systems, almost all of them, have divided mood disorders with the cut point being polarity. You're either bipolar or you're unipolar. But if you really look at studies where you follow people with or without treatment, it actually doesn't matter, and say, how many weeks of your year or your life are you spending in one mood state versus another? The answer is the average bipolar one patient, as you correctly said, spends three times as much dep time depressed as manic. And the average bipolar two patient may spend even more. There's kind of considerable variability in those studies. But depression is indeed the dominant pole, even in bipolar one disorder. And for years as a field, we were absolutely, we blew it. We were so preoccupied with mania as the defining feature that there were almost no controlled studies on bipolar depression until the last 15 years. Nobody bothered with it, which was crazy when it became obvious that that's what most of our patients struggle with and want their most desperate help from. So again, and if you think about it, there are, all, there are also patients who we think of as either mania predominant or depression predominant. What does that mean? A mania dominant individual, whether it's bipolar one or two, they're mostly bipolar ones, are people who have, let's say, 10 manic episodes and two depressions. For them, you really got to think about how to control or really prevent the manias. But how about the person who's had three manic or hypomanic episode and 18 or 20 depressions? It's actually very common, especially in bipolar two disorder. Would we treat them the same? Well, if you're not too sophisticated as a psychiatrist, you might. But our medications differ in their efficacy. Some of them are better at preventing highs, some of them are better at preventing lows, and some of them are equivalent at preventing highs and lows. So in fact, the algorithm of treatment, the order in which you give a patient one medication versus another, depends on something we have to remind our residents, taking a history. It's not enough to just look at what's in front of you. You have to find out the course of that individual. And you tailor the treatment to the individual, which I think is also one of Miss Gary's points, is what she calls creativity. To me, it's a matter of taking a good history and being thoughtful and providing different treatments for different individuals based on the fact that the, that the disorders are indeed different across individuals. And of course, 
we know that some people are more responsive to medication than others. It is sometimes a matter of sheer bad luck that you're not responsive to medications and it takes a long time as clearly it did with Ms. Gary. Another area in which I want to make sure that again you come away with the idea of variability is the name of the game <clears throat> is the issue about antidepressants. Ms. Gary said very clearly in her experience and maybe the experience of her father that antidepressants were very not good for her. They induced rapid cycling or ultra rapid cycling or mixed states or pharmacological mania. It clearly was that these were not the right medicines for her. And you see that with a substantial proportion of bipolar individuals. You also see with a substantial portion that without antidepressants they're in big trouble. Now, wouldn't I love to know beforehand which individuals are which? Yes, I would. And so would anyone in this room who is either a mental health professional or somebody with a mood disorder. Unfortunately, we don't really have those answers. And the data are utterly confused. No, conflicted is probably the right term. They're conflicted. They're not confused. We have studies that say different things. And this is one of the major religious disputes in our field, truly religious. There are only a handful of good studies, for God's sake. So we all read the same studies. And a substantial proportion of psychiatrists say, you should never prescribe an antidepressant for bipolar individuals. You're going to do terrible things. And another group look at the exact same set of data and say, you know, you can prescribe antidepressants with great regularity. And it doesn't seem to correlate with IQs. It really correlates with certain individual clinical experiences and biases that people have. But again, the hallmark statement I want you to come away with is that different patients are different and they require different treatments. So any psychiatrist who treats all of their bipolars in the same way is missing it because, again, of the extraordinary variability. Uh, a number of years ago, my colleague Lori Altshuler, who runs our bipolar research group, and I published a paper, and then she then did another study with another group, a larger paper, one of three now in the literature, showing what seemed conclusive to me, but I'm biased because I, one of my, I, I was part of the study, that there are a subgroup of bipolar people whose optimal maintenance treatments, long-term prevention, was a combination of mood stabilizers and antidepressants. And if you look at the people who you stop those antidepressants, they relapse into depression far more than the ones who stay on the antidepressant with the mood stabilizer. Not only that, in this subgroup of people who are on mood stabilizers and antidepressant, there is in the three, all three studies, there's no increase in mania. Now that's not true for everybody, but there are a subgroup of depression-prone bipolars who we really have to work hard to treat well because the goal is to prevent mania and to prevent depression. It's not enough to just pay attention to mania. Depression is just a dreadful state, and again, it is the dominant pole. Remember your Saturday night party phrase to use. So, what are universal experiences in bipolar disorder? Well, one, it's not universal, but it's pretty close, is the immensely frustrating for patients as well as physicians of the trial and error process that it takes. You described that alarmingly well. How many years, how many treatments did it take till you got to even okay enough? Unfortunately, it's not everybody, but that's the rule rather than the exception. If you look at all psychiatric disorders, more bipolar individuals are on polypharmacy, meaning multiple medications, than any other disorder. Depression, schizophrenia, anxiety disorders, doesn't matter. Now, what does that mean? Well, if one medicine really worked so well, you wouldn't putting, be putting people on second and third and fourth medications. Now, sometimes the combinations are a little chaotic, and sometimes they are creative. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. But the point is, if we had single medicines that worked as well as we'd like, we wouldn't be using second, third, and fourths. So even psychiatrists can figure that one out. So we have many combinations. Another almost universal theme in bipolar disorder is the interaction between biology and psychology, which you touched upon a little bit. The biology is obvious. Bipolar disorder and probably ADHD are the two most genetic disorders in psychiatry. But no study shows that in twin studies, for instance, that monozygotic twins, identical twins who are genetically identical, 
If one of them has bipolar disorder, in no study does 100% of their twins have bipolar disorder, meaning there's something else, whether they're what's described as epigenetic medicines, which are the expressions of genes that are turned on and off by environmental experiences, or straight old environment, environmental experiences, is yet unclear. But it can't be all genetic, and we know that. Environment really matters. When you talked about your father committing suicide when you were 16, so what, is, what does that tell you? What that tells you is clearly there's genetic vulnerability to mood disorders, which seemingly you inherited, but what's it like to have a tragic event at age 16? How does that affect somebody psychologically? Does, if, you're, if you have the genetic vulnerability and you have a much more peaceful upbringing or life, who has a peaceful life, Will that change the likelihood that you're going to have the disorder versus if you have some really tragic things happening? Early childhood a, a neglect and abuse, a, a real tragedy at age 16, such as a parent killing themselves. So the idea of us getting reductionistic about biology is just crazy. Biology matters desperately, as does psychology. We are never going to have a bipolar gene, just like, unfortunately, we're never going to have a suicide gene. All phenomena in psychiatry are polygenic. We have, within our department, one of my colleagues is Nelson Freimer, who's maybe the leading bipolar genetic researcher in the world. And he's been studying these families in Panama and Colombia, where there's inbreeding, and it's an easy, easier place to study genetic transmission. And I asked him to come to our mood disorders clinic a few weeks ago and give us an update on his work. And what he made clear is they've discovered, at this point, maybe 35, 40 genes that are associated with the risk for bipolar disorder, and there are assuredly many more. No one of those genes is the bipolar genes. gene. This, it's a series of genes that work in concert. And my fantasy, and this could turn out to be complete nonsense, so my fantasy is, well, all right, if you have 35 of them, or four important ones and 10 minor ones, you'll be bipolar 1. And if you have 32 genes, you'll be bipolar 2. And if you have 16, you'll be what's called bipolar spectrum disorders. You go up and down, but just not as much as the DSM talks about. And if you have six genes, you'll cry at Julia Roberts movies. I don't know. <laughs> just there'll be some way of categorizing the different dimensions of bipolar disorder. I think it's exciting. The clinical utility of this is still very early. Um, implied in my biology psychology comment is that medication is frequently, if not usually, not enough. Again, I'm so thrilled that one of my other colleagues here at UCLA is David Miklowitz, who's a psychologist and certainly the national expert and maybe the world's expert on psychotherapy in bipolar disorder. And he has shown in study after study, and there are many studies using different therapies, that medication plus psychotherapy, these specific therapies, um, are associated with fewer manias and especially fewer depressions and especially, especially fewer hospitalizations. Why all the insurance companies don't look at those data and mandate that everybody with a mood disorder gets psychotherapy, they would save money. But they seem not to know what's a literature that's out there in publicly available journals that show conclusively Psychotherapy with bipolar disorder keeps people more well, and it saves money. And for those of you who want to know more about it, my small plug, David and I two weeks ago published a book on integrating medication and psychotherapy in bipolar disorder. It's called Mikulitz and Gitlin by Guilford Press is the publisher. So feel free to look it up on Amazon. I'll get to number two million. What's the name of it? Like I know. <laughs> Clinician's Guide to Bipolar Disorder, colon, Integrating Pharmacology and Psychotherapy. <laughs> Say that at parties, too. Um, so let me finish, since I know we need to stop in a few minutes to open for questions. I loved Ms. Gary's ending, which were, there were two, at least as I took from it, two hallmark endings. One is never give up, and two, be creative. The never give up, anybody who has treated bipolar disorder knows you don't do the treatment and you're done. You do the treatment, you fiddle with the treatment, it's like a recipe. And you add a little this and you take away a little that and somebody gets a little manic and you lower this and you raise that 
and you do this forever. And that's the nature of the art at this point. The second thing, however, is, the second comment you made was about creativity. Let me say a word about pharmacological creativity. The, the idea, as they say in baseball, is you've got to hit the sweet spot. The sweet spot is to think about creativity, but not to leap to creativity until you've done the basics. Most people who are not well treated in mood disorders in general are not well treated because they haven't, the basics haven't been done well. The right medicines at the right dose for the right amount of time have not been given in a systematic algorithm or order of treatment. But if all you have is systematic algorithms, you and your patients are in big trouble because there are an awful lot of people like Ms. Gary who are not going to fit into our nice little box. So the goal has to be that we have a combination of doing the basics well, and when those don't work, then we're creative, always keeping in mind looking for the risks as well as the benefits. Any medicine that's worth taking can give you side effects. So there's nothing perfect out there. So we have to be respectful of this in the pros and in the advantages and disadvantages of any treatment. So never give up and be creative in the middle ground sense of the term is how I would like to end this. Thank you. Okay, we're, we have uh, some time for questions here before we go out to the foyer where Julianne will be signing copies of her book. Um, got a, predictably a lot of questions, um, and probably the most of the questions actually uh, were about you and, and your family, Julianne. Um, uh, my favorite one has to be, motherhood is a taxing occupation. Motherhood combined with bipolar disorder is beyond my comprehension. Uh, a number of people who wrote questions wondered both about the, the impact of the disorder on your husband, on your marriage, on your kids, and the support that your family provided for you um, throughout all of the struggles with your illness. Can you comment on that a little bit? Uh, sure. Um, I the, the long period of time during which I was sick, the seven year period, stretched across a, a large part of my um, children's childhood. Um, and I, we live in a small apartment in New York City um, and it was extraordinarily uh, difficult um, and it was very important to my husband and to me that um, they, were affected as little as possible. And there were times when uh, we live across the street from Riverside Park, there were times when I actually left the apartment um, frequently and went to the park to, you know, um, lose it, as, as we would say. And it was, um, you know, it was, it was uh, there's no ideal situation for this kind of thing. Um, and there came a time when they were old enough when we, had to explain to them what was going on and, and we were honest with them about it. And I, I happen, I'm, I'm extraordinarily lucky. I have two really amazing, very compassionate uh, kids and um, they have been nothing but incredibly supportive um, and uh, really wonderful and, and understanding. Um, but uh, there were, you know, days and weeks during which I couldn't get out of bed. Um, and my husband is the first one to admit that um, it, seven years of being <coughs> ill is, you know, a chronic illness is, you know, not easy on a marriage. And there are times when he's been able to be very supportive and times when he has done and said the wrong thing. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to, to live with somebody who is, is bipolar. Um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's, it, there's a high divorce rate among, among uh, bipolar people that were still married, so. Thank you. Um, there were other questions as well about other kinds of support. Um, 
and different kinds of resources that are available, but also different kinds of support that are important. Uh, Michael, seeing as many bipolar patients as you have over the years, what, what, what's your perspective on support and resources that can be extremely helpful? They can often be exceedingly helpful and sometimes not, as always, as in any relationship. It really has to do with, is this relationship right between the individual and the group? Sometimes, for instance, you'll see somebody go into the group, and if the group is either too high-functioning or too low-functioning for that individual, they will feel different and separate and walk away. Just as in the 12-step world, no AA meeting is identical. And the smart people go around to the meetings to find the right ones. But there are a number of really good self-help meetings, self-help groups like NAMI that has meetings all the time. I'm sure some of you in the audience are, uh, are involved with NAMI or the DBSA group, which is specifically about mood disorders. I mean, these are groups that are really very helpful because if nothing else, they absolutely help decrease the isolation that people sometimes feel. Your, your insane story about the, you know, the, the emergency room and the stigma and how you feel appropriately separated from everybody else walking into the ER is a perfect example of that. So the idea of having other people um, who know about the illness, have been through some of it. I mean, think of the power of AA meetings. If you want to know how helpful groups can be for some people with psychiatric troubles. I would ask, is anybody in the room involved in one of those groups? A few. Anyway, so that's my thought. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And we certainly do have a very active NAMI chapter in Los Angeles. Uh, you can go to namila.org and learn more about it. See Sharon and I got on the website for you. Uh, um, uh, Julianne, any, your perspective on uh, groups or other resources of support from me? Um, I have to have an extraordinary group of girlfriends um, who um, I could not have survived without. Um, and so close friends were um, really critical for me um, basically the entire time. <coughs> Uh, from the time I was a teenager um, through today. Uh, um, and I didn't discover NAMI until very recently, actually. Um, but I think they're a tremendous, tremendous <coughs> organization. So, um, and I think the, the programs and the family education um, groups that they have uh, are really spectacular. And um, I think that um, my life during this really difficult period would have been made um, much easier had we found NAMI sooner. Thank you. Um, there were a number of, you know, kind of uh, technical and informational questions that we got, and there's a limit to what one can get in terms of talking about specific medications, but one point that um, you touched on, Julian, and Michael, you did in your comments as well, uh, Talking about different types of bipolar disorder, rapid cycling, uh, the fact that, that that catchy cocktail party phrase, de depression is the dominant pole. Um, one of the questions was, how many different types of bipolar disorder are there? Michael, do you want to take a step? Well, I, again, it depends how much you're an aficionado of the DSM. In the DSM, there is, as I described, bipolar one and bipolar two. But it does acknowledge, and even DSM-4 acknowledged it, that there are people who go up and down but won't meet the formal criteria. Colloquially, we call them bipolar spectrum disorders. And there is a lot of work going on right now about that. Now, please know, in every disorder in psychiatry, once you define it with discrete boundaries, which of course don't exist in nature, you're always going to say, well, gee, there are people who look like that but not quite. Schizophrenia spectrum disorders, obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders, like trichotillomania would be an example. Um, autism spectrum disorders, that's really how Asperger's got started is as an autism spectrum disorder, and bipolar spectrum in the same way. Those are the individuals where, again, you're not sure. And often what the psychiatrist does is says, well, they're bipolar spectrum, so I, we should treat them as if they're bipolar ones. The problem is, there's not a single controlled study that's ever been published on bipolar spectrum disorders. 
So whether those are individuals who should be treated with mood stabilizers and you should be careful about antidepressants is still as yet unclear. Doesn't mean you should or shouldn't. It means there are zero studies. Once you're in that fuzzy diagnostic area, the problem is each study will define individuals differently and it's hard to generalize from one study to another, which is why the Lord invented the DSM. So we would have <laughs> at least a set of working definitions. So it's, but that bipolar spectrum disorders we talk about all the time in the Mood Clinic. Thank you. Um, there were many more questions about the nature of your experience, Julianne, we can possibly get to this evening, but one that I thought was interesting um, was representative of several of them, and that is, how long did it take you to recover to a state of what we'll call normalcy from uh, a manic break? I mean, the, the profound disorganization that you, that you described so eloquently in the passage you read from your book. How long did it take you to sort of feel like you were getting back into some semblance of balance in your life? Um, that's, it's, it's really hard to answer that because I was cycling so rapidly um, during that period of time that um, I would and I, and I would go from mania to depression to mixed state back with so the, the periods of normalcy or euthymia were virtually non-existent for almost, um, for almost seven years. I, I spent a lot of time depressed. Most of the time was depression. Um, so I, I went from mania to a, like a severe crash most of the time. There was not a period where I went back to just being normal until I became stable on this, this um, fairly little known drug, amantadine, um, which will be uh, three years in September. So that is the long answer to that question. Three years in September. Thank you. There were a, a number of questions about the relationship between uh, bipolar disorder and substance use and abuse. Um, and in particular, there were a, a few questions about uh, the effects of marijuana, uh, lots of interest in that with legalization of med uh, marijuana, medical marijuana. Uh, one of the questions that was interesting was, is medical marijuana helpful for bipolar disorder? Um, Show but, us your card. <laughs> Um, Chair, comment, Michael? Sure. All right, let me say a few first general comments about the relationship between bipolar disorder and substance abuse. If you look at a bipolar population, you will see a far higher incidence of substance abuse than in any other disorder in psychiatry, and of course, more than, uh, more than in the, the population at large. If you go into a substance abuse facility, you'll see some increase in bipolar disorder but you're gonna see a lot of misdiagnosed bipolar disorder. If you're tooting up cocaine every day, it's real hard to diagnose mania, right? So a lot of people are labeled bipolar because they're not telling their, their doctors that they're really using drugs all the time. So there are lost, a lot more misdiagnoses in the substance abuse world. There's some reason to think that having both disorders makes the bipolar disorder more difficult to treat. So I, I would assume that was obviously true. Actually, not every study finds that, but most of them do. It's enough trouble just trying to get euthymic, as Ms. Garrett was saying, without having substances be knocking your brain biochemistry off at every stage in different directions. That just takes a hard job and makes it much, much harder. So now let me say a word about marijuana specifically. There, there are some convincing studies that smoking marijuana as an adolescent, if you are vulnerable to having a psychotic disorder, and it's not specific to bipolar disorder, it's mostly schizophrenia, that smoking marijuana, worse than cocaine or heroin, surprisingly, will make the disorder come on sooner. It will lower the age of onset. So if you have people who are vulnerable to major psychiatric disorders, that's the one time you'd want to say, you know, if you could avoid marijuana for a while, like in your teens, which isn't so easy to do, this would be a very smart thing. 
Um, and whether this is specific to bipolar disorder has not yet been shown. But given the relationship with psychotic disorders, I really try to get late adolescent patients to not use drugs, which as anybody who's been a parent of a late adolescent patient knows is awfully difficult to do. That was actually drilled into my kids' heads by our pediatrician who at a certain age, the parents uh, know this, you get kicked out of the room. And my son came and said, you know, I, I, he, Dr. Max, that's his name, gave me the sex, drugs, and rock and roll talk. Um, and he said, you know, yes, I tell everybody, you know, don't do drugs. But he said, with your family's history of mental illness, really, you cannot smoke pot, not even once. Not one time, you know, have a beer, don't smoke pot, not once, because it could trigger bipolar disorder. And, you know, so they're scared to death, so it's good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, whenever we do a, a program that really you know, touches your heart like this one does, we get a series of questions that really just tear at you. And some of the ones this evening are, what advice would you give to the mother of a 22-year-old young woman who's been diagnosed as having bipolar disorder? Um, how would you recommend supporting a friend whose child is 21 has been diagnosed as bipolar? Um, you know, how, what do you do when you're the parent of somebody who is psychotic and in the hospital? I mean, these obviously are, there are no easy answers to these kinds of questions. Um, and I'm sure that Julianne and Jake, you probably get these all the time. Um, thoughts that you'd want to share? Um, my best advice is to find a, a doctor who really knows about bipolar disorder. Um, I think that all too often people go to a general psychiatrist who doesn't know enough about bipolar disorder, they can diagnose it, but they don't know the subtleties and the nuances and how to treat the individual, exactly what you were saying about the variability in the illness. And um, you know, knowing when a drug is working and when a drug is not working is, um, you know, and, and how long the drug trial should be, how, how many side effects to put up with and how long you should put up with them. And um, it's, it's not something a, a general psychiatrist can necessarily um, deal with. And I think finding the right doctor is, is critical. Um, and, and if it's not working, to, to switch to, to someone who, who is. Um, that's, that's the most important thing. Thank you. Um, Michael, since not everybody in this, you can't treat everybody in this room um, and their families, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, I agree with what Ms. Gary said. The other thing I would say, having a relative, and especially a child, even a young adult child, with bipolar disorder is a subset of the larger issue of having an ill relative from any disorder. If we really think that mood disorders are disorders of the brain, with psychological and biological elements, then how would you, as, as a, a friend of somebody who had that, what would you do if their child had a traumatic brain injury It was in the hospital? You would be supportive and helpful. I, this is not instead of what you were no. saying, absolutely. But I think, as you were describing, the problem is as soon as sometimes you say, my son is bipolar or my whatever, my relative is bipolar, the conversation stops in a different way than if you say, yeah. my son has diabetes, right? It just, it just is not the same, but it is that larger subset. Be a good friend. Be kind to them as you would be to whatever the disorder of the loved one would be, and then help them make sure they get good care. I absolutely agree with that one. Um, Julianne, there was a, a very interesting question for you. Um, Extraordinary accomplishment to have written this very beautiful book while, as you say, ill and unstable. What can you say to others who are uh, struggling to be creative but have not yet gotten to that point, and, and how did you get to that point? Um, hmm. I didn't say it was an easy question. 
I just said it was interesting. Uh, uh, I guess, let's see. Um, well, this isn't the, the first, um, this isn't the first thing that I uh, had written. This, um, I had been writing a sort of, I don't have any other skills. Uh, let me put it that way to begin with. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think the only thing that you can do is to actually do what you're trying to do. Um, you know, if you write, sit down and write. If you paint, sit down or stand and paint. If you compose, just keep doing it. It took me a very, very long time to write this book. There were people around me writing books who knocked out a book in a year. It took me seven years to write this book. Um, if you are sick and you are trying to create something, don't look around you and compare yourself to other people and beat yourself up about how long it's taking you to create. Give yourself the space and the time um, to do what you have to do and be sick and let yourself um, take however long it takes. Uh, and, and, you know, the most difficult thing for me um, being, being ill was um, recognizing what I could and couldn't do um, because it wasn't the same as what I could and couldn't do before I got sick. And that has been a struggle all the way along. So I think that's about it. Great, thank you. Um, we have another stack of questions about this thick, but we, we need to start drawing things to a close because I know people are going to want to have Julianne autograph their book. Um, if I could ask you to stay with me here for just a couple more minutes. First, thank you so much, Julianne. It's a wonderful <laughs> Michael, thank you very much for your excellent discussion. And, and for providing a, a medical perspective this evening. I'm sorry we don't have uh, Dr. Gitlin's book um, in the foyer from the autograph. You can find it on Amazon under psychological thrillers. I, I hear it's a real page turner. Uh, many Many thanks to the friends for putting on uh, this program this evening.